I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, and welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and with me, of course, is Steve. G'day, guys. And we are very lucky today to have with us Dr. Alisa Sparrow. Hello. Hi. And you're the district ecologist for the Fluria Wollonga Basin. That is correct. We, <laughs> we had a bit of a chat the other night about some of the things that you do in your role. We're really grateful that you've agreed to come on and have a bit of a chat about it. And we know you had to get special permission to talk about some of your projects. Mm-hmm. So um, let's get straight into it. Western pygmy possums, one of my favourite animals. We've had them on the show before. You know a little bit about those guys. Yeah, well, I'm learning as I go. But yeah, though, we've been doing some work on them now for just over a year. Very, very cute little critters. But in, um, they can be found throughout most of South Australia, but down the Flurio, they're actually classified as endangered because the population has moved sort of from the central hills of the Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges and is contracting down towards the Flurio. So there's not a lot known about them down here. And if you've, you know, you would know that you don't really see them very often because they're so tiny. They only weigh average 13 grams, about the size of a 50 cent piece. That's ridiculous, isn't it? And for people overseas, they can sit like on your thumb yeah. and they've got plenty of room. Yeah, <laughs> tiny, tiny little things and they're nocturnal and they're quick. So for normal everyday Joe Blow to wander around, would never really see one because they're so small, they're out at night time and they're so fast. So they're quite hard to, to see and understand and monitor. So we thought that... Uh, Using nest boxes might be a bit of a tool for monitoring pygmy possums. Um, Cameras don't often pick them up because they don't seem to come to a lure like some of the other little critters that we might get here. We use peanut butter and everything seems to like peanut butter except for pygmy possums. Really? Yeah, (laughs) we've since discovered that. All the native rats and the bandicoots will come up to a lure with peanut butter in them so we can get photos of them, but pygmy possums Is just... That right? Yeah. I've even heard um, a colleague say overseas stunning squirrels and things have used peanut butter to attract some of their animals, but not our little pygmy possum. No, they don't seem to like it. The only photos we've ever got of pygmy possums, they look startled, like they run in front of a camera and just like, what is that? But they never actually actively come to the to the peanut butter lure that we'll use for most of our camera monitoring, so... Yeah, they're tricky little critters to, to get some information on, so we thought nest boxes might be a bit of a bit of a tool. The other way that you can monitor pygmy possums is using pitfall traps. Ah. I want to ask you about wombats. I know Steve loves wombats. I can't stand them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love them. They, they've got to be one of the weird, weird things to say about wombat, but one of the cutest animals I mm. think I've ever seen. Even the big adults just look like they want a great big cuddle. I know that's not wise. Um, I've got scars to prove that they yeah, want a cuddle. I'd, I'd, I'd still try, I think. And I know the horror stories. <laughs> no, I love them. I agree. That's why I got into them. I don't know if you've ever seen the old school RSPCA ad back from the 80s when I was a little girl. <laughs> there was an RSPCA ad and all the animals had little bandages and they'd run across the screen and this little wombat, which was bandaged, would come out, turn around and go back and come out and turn around and go back and it was just, that's where my love of wombats came from. you got to YouTube it. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All creatures grow in school. That's the one, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> we'll have a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and you did some work with wombats. I think, I believe it was your PhD was on wombats. It? Yeah, it started... Started with my honours project, then it went to my PhD project, and then it was five years at the Adelaide Zoo running the, the Southern Hairy Nose Wombat Conservation Program, and then about another two years working for the Department of Environment doing a grassland project that did involve wombats as well. So 12 years all up of wombats. Long yeah, time. I think we'll finish there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, I do love wombat too. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> do, now, they, they're destructive out in the farmland. Yeah, I mean, they dig some massive holes and uh, they, do, they can cause a lot of damage to, to farmers' properties. You know, they'll dig under um, fences and so stock can get out and they'll dig under water, tanks and they'll undermine it so much that water tanks can implode. And uh, on some of those properties where they are, they're like massive, massive properties. So it's it's not like they can be fences and water troughs and whatnot can be checked regularly because they're such big properties. 
Uh, and they also have a tendency to dig holes um, in cropping paddocks. And whilst the farmers can avoid the holes because they can see them, they can't sometimes avoid the undermining of the tunnels. So I do know a farmer who was driving his header in a cropping paddock, avoiding the wombat holes, and the ground collapsed underneath him and it broke an axle on his header, which I think cost like 100 grand to fix. Plus then, you know, that was over on the West Coast, so trying to get that fixed in a certain amount of time to get your crop out was, yeah. (laughs) So you can can understand if farmers don't like wombats. Yeah, they, they, I can understand why they get frustrated. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Are you, I mean, you've obviously spoke to a lot of landholders and mm-hmm. farmers. Are you ever shocked at their opinion of wombats? We did some surveys in 2011. We did find that I think it was like 75 80% don't want to see wombats go extinct or get rid of them. It's just that they want ways to manage them so that they can you know, effectively farm because it's a big financial concern for them. It also can be a bit of a safety risk if you're you know, mustering in a car or on a motorbike and you can't see a wombat hole and yeah. in your car goes. You know, I've driven a car a couple of times into a wombat hole whilst driving oh, slow. Right. So, you know, it's not... They're, they're sometimes you just cannot... I've you just cannot see them. Motorbikes yeah. just being destroyed and the people on them in some instances well, just going into... Yeah, into the burrows. There's some pretty yeah. big old networks of burrows, some you could stand up in and stuff, I believe. Yeah, yeah, there's... There are some of those, but uh, I think the biggest problems are the ones where, yeah, they're digging in, like, problem areas, like under a tank or under a house or something, you know, under a railway line, which is one that we've had to deal with oh, before, right. which obviously is very, very dangerous for wombat and for train and people on train. Um, and the problem with wombats is no matter, no matter what happens, whether you remove a wombat, like, non-lethally or lethally, is quite often that it's that recurrence of, you know, once you remove the wombat, another wombat, and like maybe fill in the hole or whatever, another wombat will come and redig that hole. It's like they're drawn to, drawn to it, and they can redig it and they'll recolonise it. So I think that's what farmers find really frustrating is that constant, you know, fill in the hole, recolonise, fill in the <laughs> hole, recolonise, fill in the hole, recolonise. So. So you can actually relocate them. Is that possible? Do they? Act well to that, or yeah. So we did some not studies. The farmers, the... Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, we did some uh, studies on that um, over in the Murraylands, where we did translocate some wombats to see how well they'd respond to that. And yeah, they they moved fine. They're pretty robust little critters as well. If there's as long as there's feed available and you know empty empty warrens available for them, then they seem to have been moved fine. Yeah, but then you'll still have the problem of wombats redigging that hole. So we did do a bit of research over on the West Coast. It was just a very preliminary study using dingo urine to see if it would stop wombats digging just in those certain problematic areas. And, yeah, we found that it did actually stop them digging. Um, but that was, yeah, it was a very small study, very small sample size, but it certainly had some interesting preliminary results. Um, but I just haven't had a chance to follow it up. Yet. So, so a dingo being the Australian predatory dog-like animal. Correct. Wombats go. I don't want to mess with this guy. Yeah, ah. that's exactly right. So, I mean, you know, the scent of uh, predator animals has been used in a lot of different studies to deter prey animals, but we weren't sure if it would work with wombats. It didn't stop them being in the area, but it stopped them re-digging that burrow up because wombats will use up to 10, 11, 12 burrows. So, you know, it's not like if you get rid of one, that they don't have other ones to go to. So we're very careful when we did the study to make sure that the burrow that we sort of put out of use was, um, there was plenty of burrows elsewhere that they could still utilise. It's just that we're putting that one burrow out of use that, you know, was the problem burrow. Yeah. That's interesting. Have you been to the Big Ben Wombat I don't even know what it's called. We went there once. It's like a, they, they had a farm and they decided to have a crack at tourism. Yes. You, you've seen this? Yes. Um, that's like a Big Ben uh, out of Sedan Way. Yeah, Big Ben, yep. 
Yeah. yeah. I don't know what's called. I'd like to give a plug. I don't know if they're still operating. We yes. went out there about eight years ago. They are still going. Yes. Yeah, they're still there. It's quite good. They, they stick you on the back of a tractor mm-hmm. and give you a blanket and you're just like kind of on the trailer and they, they tow you around and they go spotlighting for birds and you know, we saw a frog mouth and some wombats. Yeah. I, I do. I would say that we saw more wombats driving up there yeah. um, <laughs> than when we drove around their paddocks, but it was good to see them trying to utilise the wombats in with what they were doing. I believe they do a day show too. We were there in the evening, but I believe they've got some dogs. and Yeah, I think they do quite a range of different things there. They do meals and all sorts of stuff as they well. Do. I believe, they, yeah. Excellent. I think you, the paddle boat can stop there and yeah. get, get off in your houseboat and walk in and do it. I don't know. It's a pretty specky spot right on the, you know, it's the Murray with spot. the cliffs opposite as well, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, beautiful spot. Um, so, so just to clarify, the, the farmers don't hate the wombats. They like the wombats, but they just hate what they do and they want better ways to live with the wombats. Correct. Most of them are like that. They just want to. They just want tools to manage, manage them better, so they can still, you know, make a living, and the wombats can still happily go on their merry way. It's just a pretty complicated situation. Because we eat the same food. They eat grass. We eat grass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They eat grass, we sell grass. I think it's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we should cut them in. <laughs> we should. <laughs> so you do a lot of community consultation, and especially in your current role. What, what are some of the things that people can do if, if they want to maybe help some of these small mammals or some of you know, the native animals that are left in the areas that they live in? There's a few different things you could do. I suppose if you've got land yourself then protecting that land is one of the biggest things you can do. You know, if you've got a massive or even a small block of remnant scrub, then looking after that is, is always the best thing that you can do. So protecting that, so that might mean fencing it off from stock if you've got stock or looking at, you know, grazing pressures on the property and reducing that. Uh, other things, particularly, uh, I suppose, in the peri-urban environment is uh, responsible cat ownership. <laughs> Keeping cats inside is always the big thing because they do take out a lot of, you know, birds, reptiles. Yeah, but my cat mammals. doesn't. My cat doesn't roam. My cat only eats <laughs> introduced mice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a, a photo online that I have seen of a, a cat with a bandicoot, which is quite, quite distressing, and I use it in my presentations to just highlight the fact that, you know, cats predate on small mammals and they also carry toxoplasmosis which can be passed on to to mammal species uh, which you know can be detrimental to their health as well so, so even if they don't kill the animal they just got to scratch it and they can make it sick and, and it can be passed through their um feces as well through the cat's feces yes to the... yeah so so yeah so keeping cats inside is a win. That's a win. <laughs> it Even is a win. Natives, I, look, I, I've got three acres of, um, well, two thirds of my property, so I've got about just over two acres of remnant scrub, and it's the joy of my life. Yeah. And I want to extend that scrub out to the other uh, acre. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's not fenced. I mean, I, I have native roos come through, like western greys come through, and I kind of like that. Yeah. Free, free flowing. Um, but I mean, the I've fence got... is not going to stop them anyway. Oh, you're Bruce. right. <laughs> yeah. Hot tip. I'm talking more about stock. Stock, yeah, yeah cows yeah. and sheep and stuff. Yeah. Um, but no, I love it, and I've, I've so far I've, I've got a hundred species of plant that I've identified there, and I think a lot of people forget about like everyone's everyone's focused on animals, and I know that animals are a great tool to engage people. They yeah. really are. That's what I do. So, yeah. You know, go around and show people at bedtime, and then bore them for the next twenty minutes about habitat. Mm. But they have it's such an important message, you know, the foundation of everything is the habitat absolutely and and there's lots of things that people can do without even having that remnant scrub you know um so even if you've got a farm that's got crops or uh stock you know you can plant paddock trees you know like a little groups of trees every now and then it's not only going to be beneficial for your stock you know it provides shade it provides nutrients to the soil etc but it you know it helps provide um spots of habitat for birds and whatnot you know that meat allows sort of breaks up that mm. that vast nothingness between the blocks of remnant you know almost gives providing them, a corridor yeah stepping yeah. stones just so, you know just something to to help them move between the the bigger blocks and you know a lot of birds like that sort of open grassy area to to hunt or mm. whatnot in there they use those branches of those paddock trees to 
to perch and look out over the grasslands and whatnot. So planting that sort of thing, even if you don't want to plant, yeah, like a whole massive heathy scrubland on your property, you can do, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, can, do you can do something um, yeah. to, to help. Even in suburbia, if you've just got a, you know, 700 square metre property or something, you could put your local native plants in there. Exactly. And you'll find them. I mean, we did it. We, our last house was in Mount Barker, which is the <coughs> suburbs. We had a small property that was lawn. And uh, over a few years, we'd, we'd put back about 100 species on that small bit of what was yep. lawn, a lot of ground covers. I think we were finding all sorts of species coming in. We had four frogs would come through, all the little skinks. You know, the wrens started to come because there was the insects for them. You know, biodiversity, and you think of fauna, and people do think birds, reptiles, mammals. But there are other things, like around the McLaren Vale area, you know, insects. And if you've got the right insects coming into the vineyards then you, they'll predate on the sort of bad insects, the ones that eat the grapes. So if you plant the right plants around a vineyard, the right natives, you could get the sort of beneficial uh, insects, the, the predatory arthropods that will, you know, predate on the ones that eat the, that eat the grapes. So you've got sort of like this great... That's good. Yeah, this great story of how, you know, biodiversity and production actually work together and, you know, can be of a real benefit... So, yeah, you can't forget the insects. They, you know, provide a benefit too, really strong benefit. So. I think so. We had Chris from Bugs and Slugs on last week and she spoke about insects for an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> so we, yeah, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> we have to. We have to. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> but planting the correct plants like our garden, where we, we're trying to put some natives in, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly blank anyway we've got a blank canvas where we are really but the, the butterflies and things that mm. we just automatically get there it's just amazing and uh, yeah that's the start of it plants insects exactly then you get bats mm. you get other all yeah. sorts of other things so putting out artificial nest boxes can be of benefit too mm. if you don't have enough trees or old hollows or whatever you know you can put boxes up for all sorts of animals not just pygmy possums as yeah. we've talked about <laughs> but you know there's Bigger possums, there's bats, like the microbats, and there's yeah. all sorts of birds that will benefit from having nest boxes up there as well. There's a big swing towards insect hotels, which are what nesting boxes for invertebrates too, I believe. Yeah, right. I haven't yeah. seen much about that. but I see a lot of schools, put the kids put them together. They, yeah, they right. look like crap, but apparently they work. <laughs> <laughs> they look rubbish. They look oh, absolutely yeah. rubbish. But you get people on board, like what you just said about the grapevines and the beneficial plants attracting the insects, which... I mean, that saves the, those guys money. Yeah. So that's, that's obviously where your role is super important because people often care about money, especially yeah. if they're in business. But, for, I mean, for people like myself and I think all three of us here at this table, and hopefully some of the listeners, there's a massive benefit just to reconnecting with nature. I mean, we, we've kind of destroyed a lot of it and we, we spend a lot of our time on roads and in houses and, you know, this kind of stuff. And um, I think people are yearning for the health benefits of nature too. So there's that intrinsic element, which is hard to put a dollar value onto. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's another way people can help too is going out and there's so many volunteer groups and, you know, community groups that do so many amazing things in the parks and in the, on their private properties and everything. And uh, that's a really good way to volunteer because you get out there, you get out and, you know, it's healthy because you're out walking about and you're pulling weeds and you're planting things and, yeah, you get to connect with nature. So even if you live in, you know, suburban Adelaide, there's still plenty of places to go volunteer and uh, contribute and, and you get often, out there. I think so too. And you're going out with people that know stuff too. You're going out with people that yeah. will share stuff with you and you're heading out to parts of the park most people don't get to see. That's exactly right. Yeah. And you learn so much. Like, it's so interesting when you get out with some of these people and, and some of the things you learn is awesome. People should be getting out there and doing it more. Yeah, because some of these uh, volunteer groups have been going for 30 years or so and it's had the same people in them for that long so they know... Yeah. You know, some of those parks back to front and they just know the history mm-hmm. and, yeah, they know every plant and, yeah, you just pick up so much information. But they need new people because they're finding it hard to bend down now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough gig. I mean, you know, most of us have our lives and our jobs and our kids and all these things that keep us busy and, and it is the retirees that keep the wheels on a lot of these um, projects as well. Yeah, yeah, it is, and they do an amazing job of it, but we're trying to find ways to sort of get the younger crowd more interested and involved as well. So, I mean, one of the things we're doing is starting at the schools, yeah, which that's I know you do a, do a lot with Adrian, but 
one of our um, projects, we work a lot with the Kangarilla Land Care Group uh, because there's bandicoots in Kangarilla, like in the township itself. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, oh. basically, if you've ever driven... Have you either, either of you driven through there recently yeah. and seen the big purple sign saying... Yes, endangered oh, bandicoots. Yeah, yeah, slow down endangered oh. bandicoots. Yeah. Yeah, so it started, what, 18 months ago or two years ago or so when uh, one of the forestry SA rangers found um, a bandicoot that had been hit by a car on Dashwood Gully Road and they, he took it to the Kangaroo Land Care Group and they were like, oh my goodness, it's a bandicoot. They sort of heard that there'd been bandicoots around but didn't really, you know, nothing, no one had done much with it so they brought it to us and, um, yeah, there are, you know, bandicoots are a nationally endangered species so they're pretty significant animal. There used to be like eight species of bandicoots in South Australia and now they're the, the last... The last, the last one. The southern brown bandicoot. That's the one. I'm so, in a bit of trouble. Yeah, so they're still endangered. And, um, you know, talking about the island stuff before, they did some genetic work on them. Um, I think it was through the museum. Um, and they have found that the, the ones on the Flurio are genetically, uh, more genetically, or close more closely genetically related to the ones on in Western Australia than the southeast and the east coast. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're and they're the quite a genetically species. distinct population, so they're their own special little population anyway, really. Um, quite isolated, again, because, you know, they need this high rainfall because they need that dense understory to, to protect them from predators. Yep. So they can't get that, you know, out in the mallee. <laughs> so on the Fluro, they're pretty isolated, so, yes, yeah, so finding them in the township of Kangarilla was, you know, a significant, significant thing. So the Kangarilla Land Care Group were really concerned about the, the roadkill um, and wanted to do some more for the southern brown bandicoots. So, so they came to us and we started off with a workshop with the threatened fauna ecologist for the department uh, at Kangarilla and had 50 people there on a sun cold Sunday morning at the Kangarilla Primary School. 50 people turned up to learn more about bandicoots. So that was a really cool start. And then we sort of pulled together a bit of a Kangarilla bandicoot group, which consists of us, some of us from the you know, natural resources staff and then Kangarilla land care group. And we meet every sort of six weeks and have a little bit of an agenda and you know, go through things and just keep pushing this project. And one is getting those signs signs up, which make people aware that are driving down the road that there are bandicoots around. Uh, the land care group bought some cameras, some motion sensor cameras. So they're putting them around the township, which then allows us to know where the bandicoots are in the town and gets the community involved. And, you know, because people, when they find out they've got bandicoots on their property and they didn't know they have them, it's pretty exciting mm. for them. So, so yeah, it helps sort of generate that interest and then it helps us also with management because bandicoots, you know, they're sort of preferable habitat that, from our point of view, I suppose, <laughs> is that sort of thick, native, dense understory. But, you know, we don't have a lot of that around anymore. So one of the other species that they love to live in is, of course, blackberry, which is also a declared weed species. So there's a bit of a... <laughs> Yeah, I suppose a conflict of interest there because it's a declared weed species that so needs to be controlled, but bandicoots utilise it because there's nothing else in some areas for them to use. So, um, so we use those cameras and whatnot around Kangarilla as well to help people with managing like their property for weed species and bandicoots so that we're making sure that they can sort of stop the spread of weed species but they're not going to remove the bandicoot habitat. habitat. So it's a bit of a bit of a fine line. It's a balance. It is a balancing act, and and using the cameras and getting the knowledge up of bandicoots around the area really helps for that sort of management of blackberry on people's properties and and management of bandicoots as well. So yeah, so so that's part of it. Then we've got the Kangarilla Primary School, who we have started a bit of a program with. We're doing it once a year, where we go to the the classroom and we give them a bit of a talk about bandicoots and the other local animals in the area then we do a field day with them so this is the five six and seven class do a field day with them where they show them how to set up cameras 
they go around and count diggings, they collect bandicoot poo, which is obviously the favourite thing to do. <laughs> we get them to sort of assess the habitat and then, yeah, they just spend a day out with us having a bit of a look around and learning about it. Then a week later I'll take the, the cameras back in that they've set up and show them all the photos that they've collected so they get pretty good at the end of identifying bush rats versus black rats and they know what a bandicoot looks oh, like they know what an well, anti-kindness that's great, is that's the great thing with those cameras that people are starting to use more and more now it's not just yeah this is great for the bandicoots mm -hmm. and, and that but it's the other stuff that you get to see as well it's just awesome i need to get some of those for my property yeah they're great how yeah. lucky are these kids i didn't know oh, yeah. like this i didn't get to know a scientist and but that's where it's got to start that's, that's yeah what it's about yeah, do you start off with, hi guys, look, we've stuffed everything up. Um, you guys are going to yeah. have to fix it when you're older. Yeah. Let's get this started. This is your problem now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically ham. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the Kangaroo Land Care Group put in a grant as well with the, the primary school there to um, through one of their AMLR, NRM community grants uh, to get funding to set up propagation facilities at the primary school. So now they've got facilities at the primary school so they work with the Lanka group the Lanka group will be collecting the seed locally the primary school and the Lanka group will be growing the plants and then hopefully they'll go back to the community That's to great. sort of reveg areas where there's bandicoots that are, you know and the plants they're picking are specifically for bandicoots so it's a, yeah it's a really cool cool little project that's brilliant and also we uh, someone sent me a photo the other day that the general store now has a really cool painting on the side of the wall if you ever drive past which has got a band which has got bandicoots oh, on really? it and they've got yeah. a little plaque there talking about bandicoots so that's great that's what i was gonna say because like you go up to uh, i don't know if it's like this now but you drive up to victor harbour really a thoroughfare tourist road in here in south australia and there's this place in the middle you stop off called mount compass and it's near a few conservation parks there's a lot of endangered species near there like pygmy possums mm -hmm. bandicoots heath monitors um emu wrens mm -hmm. yep. And yet you go into like the gift shops and you can buy things like chickens and ducks and all sort of promoting the farm cultural part of the area, which is fine, but they've got all these really awesome animals that could be, they could be capitalising on from a tourism perspective and it doubles up as education. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's one of those things that we need to work a lot more on is that sort of interpretation side and, and education side because you know, we've t talked about it before, people don't know that we have these species. They don't even know that they exist in this area and that's that's part of the problem. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people are surprised. <laughs> <laughs> like, all I know is it's got a great bakery. Yeah. But all of a sudden it's got some cool animals as well. Yeah. <laughs> about 15 years ago, I saw on two separate occasions Bandicoot on the main street of Stirling over yeah. near that, that playground the roller roller coaster steam roller playground okay yeah so they, they, they'll come out of it like when you walk through Berlin national park they're out in the middle of the yeah. day yeah so they're kind of would that make them cathemeral nighttime and daytime yeah they're out yeah whenever they choose where yeah we get photos of them daytime nighttime they're really cool i've, you know. I've got one that we rescued from cleaner wildlife park they found it thrown from the pouch in the Tasmanian Devil enclosure oh, of all places. Um, so Tam raised that one. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they killed a devil, moved on. Yeah. <laughs> the gutsy things. Yeah. Um, so if you ever want to use him for education, he's actually the mascot for the Bandicoot Bungalow project that I think Adelaide Uni. Uh, okay, yeah, with Jasmine. That. Jasmine, yeah, yep. Jasmine Packer. Yeah. So um, yeah, he's your he's at your disposal if you want to use him, and we've got big possums if you want to, you know, use those. But I'm sure. You don't need them because you're captivating enough, but they're there for you. That's their, edu their education and The fairies always win out. And that's the great thing. I mean, that's the great thing about bandicoots and pygmy possums is, you know, all the things that we do to benefit them are going to help so many other species as well. Birds, reptiles, yeah. you know, looking after the environment, you know, revegetating things, looking after, uh, you know, responsible pet ownership, all that stuff is going to be a benefit to... A wide range of things but bandicoots and pygmy possums people just are drawn to yeah. particularly pygmy possums because they're so great. small and so cute and it's great because like you say you've got to sort out everything that surrounds and not just concentrate on the actual animal yeah know? there's a lot to do it's so interesting it's fantastic and i love how you've got the kids growing local native plants because in my mind that's one of the 
most important things we can do because you plant a local native plant, you're creating a system. The seeds will go and do the work for you. They'll inhibit the weeds. They'll plant their own plants by cell propagation because they're local native. Most of them should. Yeah. Um, we found that at uh, our last place when we revegetated that patch of lawn I mentioned. A lot of those species started coming up with their own volition, and the neighbours would come over and go, "What's that plant?" I go, "Oh, that's a whatever it was," and they go, oh, "That's come up at mine." Yeah. Oh, good, that's a rare plant. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's not a way you don't kill it. Don't kill it. <laughs> just because um, you don't recognise it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just really quickly, you mentioned how blackberry is super important for a lot of these small mammals, particularly bandicoots. Yeah. And obviously people don't want blackberry, so we, um, you've probably heard it said, don't remove weeds, but you know, replace them systematically. Yes, and that's what we work with landholders to do. So, yeah, it's about a staged removal process, so... You might, if, if you've got bandicoots and blackberry, you might, one of the biggest focuses might be to sort of stop the spread of the blackberry, so at least just contain it where it is, and then you might remove part of it, but leave, you know, majority of it there to, for the bandicoots for habitat. Then, yeah, revegetate that spot, wait for that to sort of get out to a decent size. It's a, I mean, it's a very long process, but it's worth it for, for the bandicoots, and yeah, it's just a matter of stopping the, the spread really containing. Or some of the things you can do as well is if you're finding that, like one of the properties we work on, there's, yeah, it's a massive patch of blackberry um, and there's bandicoots there. There's uh, And when we've set cameras up, we're getting adults, sub-adults and juveniles. So they're breeding <laughs> in, that, in that blackberry and there's not a lot of scrub outside. So it is quite important. So other things that we're doing there is removing things like the gorse uh, and removing the blackberry just from around the, like the native gum tree. So at least it sort of allows the gums a bit of breathing room, but it's not reducing the habitat for the bandicoots by much. And, you know, stopping the spread, removing small patches, planting in those small patches. And, oh, that's yeah. great. So in those small patches, you'll plant something that will do a that's similar native, job? That's native, yeah, that will do a similar job. But, yeah, it's... It's a long process, obviously, if you're waiting for plants to grow and get to a thick enough density. Mm. So it's, it's a long game, but... There'll be, there'll be people listening going, well, if the blackberry's working, why not just leave the blackberry? Yeah. Well... It do, well, <laughs> that, that, that's a whole other conversation about... <laughs> Biodiversity yeah, and, about, and, no, and novel habitat, you know. Like it, <laughs> it's the same when it comes to things like pine trees and yellowtail black cockatoos. You know, they, they u- utilise those pine trees for feed... But nothing else does. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's it is it's, it's a tough one, and it depends who you talk to on viewpoints of on that because you know it's whether you know some people believe that you should revegetate things back to to what it was historically. Some people think, well, it's a novel habitat; it's working. You leave it as it is. You know, the, the, and everywhere in between. So you're trying to get it back to what it was originally, but you can't just go in there with a tractor and rip that out and. No. Nah. Expect the animals to stay, so it's, you've got to meet a happy medium there somewhere. That's exactly right, and you know, imagine if you did that and tried to put it back to what it was originally, and mm. something didn't use it. At least if you do it in a stage process, mm. you can see that the bandicoots are utilising whatever you're planting before you yeah, make remove sure everything. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly that's right. Yeah, I've got one last question for you, and it's something I get asked a lot. People always send me photos of rats and say, is it native? <laughs> um, normally it's not. I can tell it's not. But I mean, is there any hot tips you can give? I mean, you really got to have photos. It's not an easy question to ask, and sometimes you can't tell from the photo given. But what are some hot tips about IDing a native? Oh, to hot tips about IDing things. Okay, well, there's a few different things there. So with rats, when you're looking at a native versus... Well, a native bush rat or a native swamp rat versus the introduced black rat, tail is the biggest giveaway. So a black rat will have a tail that is really long, longer than the combined length of the head and the body. So that's a really noticeable thing. Their faces do look a bit different, but that does take a little bit of practice, you know, getting used to. But tail is the biggest thing. If they've got a really long tail, then you're pretty much guaranteed it's a black rat. So if they've got a tail that's shorter than the length of the head or body or about the same length, then it's normally a bush rat or swamp rat. Water rats have really long tails, but water rats do look different. They look a little bit more like an otter, but water rats will have a white tip on the end of their tail anyway, so that's distinctive giveaway. Like a ring-tail possum tail. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, but it'd be wrong of me just to say we saw otters just about this time last week. We were oh, sitting Borneo, on the Kilimanjaro looking at 
We were looking at smooth otters. I'm, Jealous. I'm, I'm thinking there there's probably like, water rats now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the, uh, there's also uh, quite often mix-ups with antichinus and house mice because antichinus are sort of notorious little pilferers of food and they do get into people's houses and they do get into people's cupboards they do get into people's lounges uh, and you're saying mice are like that too <laughs> <laughs> no yeah no. so and people don't know that antichinus are even exist yeah. basically you know antichinus are not something that people know much about um, but they're a carnivorous marsupial and fun fact about antichinus you guys are going to love it I'm sure is that all males die after breeding season but wow. what a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, wow. So after breeding season, all the males Because it's not worth dead. the grief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or they just uh, are so tired that they drop dead. And um, it also, you know, is a great way to, to leave or look, increase the chances of the young and surviving because, you know, one less mouth to feed. You know, more resources for food and whatnot. So how long whatnot. do the females last at that point? Uh, I think they can go like another two or three seasons. They're not long-lived animals. Still. But, yeah, so all the poor males. And, yeah, so all the poor males die, but the little antichinus can have up to 12 young. And, you know, they're only just a bit bigger than a mouse. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can imagine. In my opinion, the male could have helped out a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that is what it's like you said. Um, yeah, sorry, back to antichinus. And mice. So antichinus and mice sometimes do get confused because people don't know antichinus exist and they do get in people's houses, they do steal food. But antichinus are quite distinctive looking compared to a mouse. They've got sort of like a pointy snout and they've got a really beautiful yellowing colour around their feet and their belly. And they've got white rings around their eyes. And once you see one, you'll know the difference. And they don't smell like a mouse. You know how mice have that sort of musty... Yes. Antichinus don't smell... And um, mice do little tiny droppings, whereas antichinus have quite large ones <laughs> no. for the size of their... So you can always tell the difference between droppings between antichinus and mice as well, but it's certainly something to keep in mind if you think you've got rats or mice and you live somewhere where there could be antichinus or native rats, that they do take, you know, poisons and things like that. Mm. So it's really important to be sort of aware of what is around you before you just you know, really nearly throw out any poisons to, to knock off what you think might be a rat or a mouse when it could be something native. And endangered. Yeah, that's exactly right. Most of our small mammals in this area are at least regionally threatened. Mm-hmm. So, and some of them are nationally listed and some of them are state listed as rare. So, yeah. And we'll sometimes think like we'll put, we'll put boxes to put the poison into, but, but things like that would get in the box as well, so you're sort of not helping. Yeah, and antichinus are really good climbers, so you can't just put something up high no. for a black rat because antichinus can climb. So we are working on a bit of a trial. Uh, I read a paper where they used this PVC piping system to um, over on an island, I think it was off the coast of New South Wales or Queensland, to bait for black rats um, without getting that off-target damage to like native bush rats or swamp rats. So we're trialling that system at the moment. We're just using peanut butter uh, to see what can get in and we're using cameras to, to check it. But Why is it pygmy possums? No. No, no pygmy no. possums. No <laughs> peanut butter for them. Yeah, but at the moment nothing's getting in, so, <laughs> so we need to refine it. Anyway, <laughs> it's only early days, so we're working on, on this system because it's, if we can get that to function, it'd be pretty good because it's cheap. It costs about $8 to make using PVC piping. So it's just tunnels of PVC piping, is it? Yeah, and it's based on the black rat's superior climbing ability. So it's just the, the piping is a certain height and a certain width so that a, you know, a black rat could climb it, whereas a native bush rat or swamp rat isn't quite as like, good a climber. So they're basically like Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible style up the inside of the pipe. <laughs> You're playing up. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then an ant kind of to be too small to, to, get to, to get to get in and actually yeah <laughs> stick its legs out to climb up. So so that's the the theory, but we haven't quite got it to work in practice yet. But we are working on it, and we'll keep working on it until we get something to to work. 
Yay for science. Mm. It would have to be some tasty food up there, though, because there's... Peanut butter? Black rats would eat anything. They love peanut <laughs> so butter. So they'll put that effort in. Yeah, they put, yeah, they would. Well, we've Laced got... Laced peanut butter. Yeah, we've got heaps of photos of... We've got the trap set up, and there's black rats on top trying to get to the peanut butter. They're sniffing it. There's bandicoots trying to get in. There's ringtails and brushtail possums sniffing it. There's foxes. There's deer. There's antiquinists trying to get in, but... So they can all smell the peanut butter, but, yeah, the black rats haven't gone in yet. <laughs> They're still trying to get to it from the outside. Maybe they're a little too smart. Is it terrible that I was just thinking there should be someone sat outside that box with a little hair rifle? <laughs> <laughs> picking, up, picking up the ones that you That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, black rats are, you know, a bit of an issue. We talk a lot about cats and foxes, but black rats mm. as well, they... they the threatened fauna ecologist has seen black rat take out an antichinus, so <laughs> predates on antichinus, and so we, you know, have the theory then that it could predate on baby bandicoots. I don't doubt that. I can tell you a story. I've seen a black rat take a joey potteroo that had come out of the pouch, <gasps> and the black rat launched on it. This was at a, a wildlife park with a restaurant where people were eating their dinner. <gasps> oh no! And all the other rats launched on this, you know, half-grown potteroo. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that at all. Yeah. Take a bandicoot. Yeah. That's exactly right. They take bandicoot. They they also wondering if they're doing the same thing. Some of those endangered birds, small birds, and the eggs, obviously. So, black rats are definitely mm. an issue. Mm. You make a good point. I mean, you know, every time they go somewhere, there's a lot of extinctions that follow. Like when they went to New Zealand, you, 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 people talk about cats and foxes. I always talk about cats and foxes when yep. in my talks I don't mention black rats. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But they do have a, <laughs> they definitely have an influence on some animals. And there's not much we can do about it. I mean, you've talked about the, the chew body, but really, I mean, they, they live in the cities, they live in the birds, they live in the country. Mm. They're um, all over the world, yeah. All over the, the world. same species of rat that's destroying everywhere. What can we do? What can we do? It's a bit of depressing now. Yeah. You've got to take the little wins, you've got to focus. You've got to focus on the small we'll things that. Back yeah. to kangaroo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's part of this, <laughs> what it's like for a, lot, for a lot of things, for all of us, I suppose, when we work in this sort of industry. If you start thinking about the big picture, it can become very overwhelming. Mm. And so you've got to take the little wins where you can because at least it's a win. Yeah, right. I mean, it makes bandicoots and antichinus and pygmy possums seem more extraordinary that they're dealing with these guys. And maybe, maybe through evolution, maybe uh, nature will strike a balance and there'll be less of them, perhaps. I don't know. I, don't know, I hope so, yeah. That would be Same with humans, there's a lot of humans. <laughs> that would never happen. <laughs> the other thing was... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> More hope there. Yeah, the rats will decide, you know, there's too many of us. Yeah, no, let's, let's just... Let's pull together, <laughs> let's have less kids, let's be, let's be sensible. Yeah. Maybe uh, we'll learn Rats would say less kids before a human does. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it seems that way. Um, Thank you very much for coming on. No worries. That was awesome. awesome. I learned heaps. So is there anything you'd like to say just to wrap up? Any projects you're working on that gets you to the edge of your seat right now? Anything non-work related even? Any messages out to people, not birthday messages. <laughs> not birthday messages. <laughs> hmm. I think the biggest thing that people need to do is just to, to be educated about what's, what's in the area what animal species might be there, but also recognising habitat. You know, a lot of people have this desire to clean up everything around a property, you know, get rid of all the dead trees or get rid of all the... that are still standing or get rid of the, the logs on the ground. But, like, some of it is fantastic habitat for lizards and birds and all sorts of things. So but then you say snakes and people go, oh, clean it up. <laughs> snakes get rid of the mice, though. So, you yeah, know, like, you, know. <laughs> you got to... You need more snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's always ways to manage these things, so... I think it's just being familiar with what is around you and managing your property for that. And I think just being educated is the best thing that people can possibly do. There's so many different ways that you can do it, you know, online, these podcasts, your NRM offices, all sorts of things. You just talk to lots of different people. You go out volunteer, you learn heaps there. You know, it's just a matter of just listening and learning and I think that's the best thing people can do. And now you've got a dream job, you're working in the environment just by following your passion from a, a RSPCA commercial on TV with a wombat. 
Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love wombats. Did I tell you I love wombats? He, he, he <laughs> really does. <laughs> you, love wombats. Yeah, you have to go out on a wombat catching trip one day. I would love to go out on a wombat catching trip. Yeah. Do you, still, there a lot of you still go on it? I haven't been on one for a while, but I mean, they, yeah, they still happen, I think. Um, because the data there has been collected for something like 25 years annually. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's a huge data set. Um, and, you know, one of these really long-term ones, which is not that common. So, so I know they try and get out at, at least once a year just to keep that, that data coming in. It's, you know, really important to, to monitor the yeah. wombat's progress over there because they've had a few, you know, ups and downs mm. over there in their time. So, so, yeah, it's really important to keep monitoring that. Is that on the Air Peninsula? I know that's in the Murraylands. Oh, OK. That, 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 that data has been collected. So... You know, there's, there's been outbreaks of mange and then there was the... Um, they thought it was a disease for a while, but it was actually um, like a nutrition. I don't know if you remember, if you saw that a few years ago. They were finding all these wombats that were hairless um, out in the daytime. Well, I think there was a TV program on about it. And yeah, and it wasn't mange because mange is caused by a mite and it causes, like, scabbing, whereas these wombats were just sort of hairless. They were a bit of a funny colour. They were, like, completely now nourished, they were going blind and all sorts of stuff. And so I thought it was a disease, but it turned out it was a nutrition thing, so there was not enough native grasses or anything for them to eat, so they were eating heliotrope, uh, potato weed, oh, yeah. Yeah. which is caused a toxicity in the liver, and then, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's a land management thing because, you know, native grasses are diminishing in a lot of places and being overrun by weeds, and that's a bit of an issue with the wombats. I read that they eat Ostrostyper. That's not exclusively, or is that their main genus of grass? Yeah, that's, their, that's the main thing <laughs> that they like to eat grass. is Styper. Uh, they'll eat wallaby grass as well, but at the moment they eat salt bush. They eat a bit of blue bush. But a lot of times all that there is in some of these areas and all that they survive on is thread iris, which oh, is like okay. nut grass. It's a weed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. nut grass, so with the single the stem and then the bowl, but then they'll dig it up and then uh, eat sort of the, the nut at the bottom, which then causes the ground to be very undulated because they're digging up all the bulbs, <laughs> which then means more weeds. But anyway, uh, they also eat... Um, <laughs> they make the soil beautiful for weeds to go. Yeah. <laughs> they also eat uh, wardsweed, uh, medic. Yeah, it's amazing what they can survive on. Sometimes you look and just think, what are they eating and how are these wombats still, you know, 25 plus kilos, but... They do find a way to survive, but yeah, heliotrope is not no, that's, yeah. is not a good one for them. It's very bad. Potato weed mm. makes me think of those big, massive gorillas sitting there just eating grass. That big, the yeah, how things. do they do that? Isn't that incredible? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wombat's bodies are just designed to survive in such a such an area. You know, they have really low concentrated urine, so they don't lose much water. Or oh, sorry, high concentrated urine, so they don't lose much water, and they um have slow metabolic rates and then the main thing is their burrows they remain pretty much the same temperature all year round so they don't sort of lose that would take some energy to dig some of their burrows oh yeah but some of those burrows particularly in the limestone country have been there for oh, ever yeah. you know <laughs> really old why is there poo cube is that water retention somehow <sighs> I don't we know. don't know yeah oh, there's a whole cubed there's like a yeah. cubed poo oh. yeah yeah, have you never seen a wombat poo? No, I don't oh. think I have noticed. It is a perfect one. cube. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's weird. So it is a perfect there, cube. They don't sit there after. No, no, they don't pat it down. It just <laughs> it has something to do with the digestion. There is a physiological reason wow. behind it. It's not a There's an article. Yeah. You can read it, okay. but I can't yeah. recite it. No. But yeah. <laughs> what a show. They're about the same size as a fantail. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and if you go out with some people, they'll trick you into and they'll put a little... They'll take the fantail wrappers and they'll put it over the oh, wombat. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're ever out wombatting and they've got fantails, just Be check. Aware. Just check the package I'm terrible, first. I'm terrible for enjoying any food. I'll probably go, oh, it's, oh, it's quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't take a handful of fantails out at night time and put it in your pocket and just oh, eat right. without looking. <laughs> that's a hot tip. <laughs> the problem is to do that, you've got to eat all those fantails and then you've got them there and then you'll probably forget and go, oh, yeah. It's, oh. Yeah. <laughs> You do it yourself. Yeah. I shouldn't give away the secrets of the wombat tree. The trade secrets. Yeah. Yeah. That's Sorry. Yeah. That's awesome. A lot of hot tips. Yeah. <laughs> 
Don't fall in a hole is another one. That's a great tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easy I've to do in the dark. That tip. Sorry? Yeah, I've lived like my life through that tip. Three, yeah. Don't fall in a hole. Don't fall yeah. in a hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheek me not a wombat one, they no. are deep. Wow. Don't fall in a hole today, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Morning mantra. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> I have one job. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Dr. Alyssa Sparrow, thank you so much. No worries. Did I say it right? No. Oh, <laughs> Alyssa. 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 Elisa. Elisa. Elisa Sparrow. I practiced it 18 times before we started this today, guys. And I, um, that was great. And, guys, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed that. I know I did. I definitely did. Need to get out there more and volunteer. We promise you'll enjoy it. Don't eat the fan tails. Thanks, guys. <laughs>